This is Northwest Nights with Frank Shires on News Talk 97.3, Cairo FM. Yeah, shoot me an email. Xfinity inbox waiting for you. Just go to MyNorthwest.com and click on email. The host, write it, send it. Bang, that's where it lands. Amanda Knox tonight, right now, is sitting in a prison in Italy because of two small pieces of DNA evidence. We had a chance to talk to the man who is advising the Knox family in her appeal process. His name is Dr. Greg uh, Hampikian. He is a professor of biology and criminal justice at Boise State. He's a director of the Idaho Innocence Project, been doing that for about uh, four years. He is nationally renowned as an expert on both DNA analysis and how it applies uh, to uh, crime solving, for lack of a better term. Dr. Hampikian, thank you for making time to come on with us uh, tonight. Oh, it's a pleasure. So you have been advising the Knox family about the DNA evidence, and we have this new thing that happened over the weekend where the independent forensic experts were given their 90 days to review it. Let's let's bring it back to just what we know, what you've been telling the Knox family about the existing DNA evidence. What can you say about it? Sure. Um, well, gosh, it was about uh, a year and a half ago, I guess, uh, that um, uh, I wrote a report uh, with another forensic expert uh, after looking at the data. Basically, there were two pieces of, uh, of evidence that were of concern to the defense. The bra yeah, class. Well, the bra class for Raphael, right. right. And the knife. And the knife for Amanda's family, right. The knife one is really the most spurious um, because... It's extremely low amount of DNA that's that's on the knife that could have been transferred really through even a secondary source. I could carry, for example, DNA from my children to work, and it wouldn't be unusual to see my kids' DNA on something of mine at work. So in layman's terms, for me, so what we're saying is there's very little DNA to begin with, and uh, they don't have really the tech, or they haven't done the process necessary to really accurately analyze it. Would that be fair? One of the problems with this case is that they didn't disclose their standard operating procedures, which is the book of instructions that a, an analyst will use in the lab. That book of instructions is key, and any time you know, I do a case, whether it's here or in London or uh, in Seattle, the first thing I ask for is that book of standard operating procedures to see what has the lab done with its own instruments, how have they validated their processes. So, Dr. Hampicki, and just cutting right to the, no pun intended, to the, to the core of this, uh-huh. there isn't going yeah. to be enough DNA evidence on that knife in order for the independent experts to retest it, right? So my understanding is that they, that's, that part of that is right, uh, and, and, and the part that you, you, you're referring to is right. They can't retest this one area of the knife. They tested four areas. One area had Meredith Kircher's DNA or DNA consistent with Meredith Kircher. My understanding is they used all of that in the single run that they were able to do, so we'll never be able to repeat that. However, um, the defense uh, for um, Amanda Knox uh, requested in this appeal that um, all testing, uh, you know, that's reasonable be done. And one of the things that we suggested was, look, if you have a knife, as in this case, that the state claims um, was uh, used to cause um, a, a lethal wound right. and and to a part of the body that bleeds very heavily, you would expect that if there was blood uh, or if there was a cut, there'd be a lot of blood. So the, the prosecution claim is, well, they clean the knife afterwards. And so um, in a recent affidavit by another expert, a U.S. expert who was advising on this, uh, the defense has asked that, um, why don't you take the knife apart? That's a pretty standard idea. If you have, these are, these are um, molded knives, and so there's a seam where the blade is fit into the plastic. Right. And that's, you know, nobody cleans that area, and it's very hard. You can't actually clean it unless you take the knife apart. So this would be the first time the knife was taken apart, and you could look for um, evidence that would be consistent with this having been used as um, a murder weapon. That's the place to look. I think my understanding of the, the, what the judge has said is he, he gets it. He's saying, of course, we should test this. We should have it independently reviewed. I don't think he's decided the issue one way or the other, but he's a, a sensible person who says, go ahead and test it. And uh, and then he, you know, they're objecting. I don't know what he's going to decide in the end. Um, I hope I hope.
hope logic wins out. Dr. Hampikian, let's talk about the bra clasp here quickly. And by the way, I'm mm -hmm. talking to Dr. Greg Hampikian from Boysen State. He's been advising the Amanda Knox family in regards to the DNA expert. He is a big-time expert on DNA. Everything that I've read about the, the bra clasp indicates that mm -hmm. in every possible way, it, it would have to have been contaminated. From the fact that it's, uh -huh. it was picked up, it was thrown back on the floor, you know, the, the DNA was exact, found on it was exactly the kind of DNA you would expect from uh, a guy like Raffaele being in that house. Where are we with the bra clasp thing? Uh, I don't know if the, the video is still on the web, but it, um, one of my students found it there, the uh, collection video of this bra clasp. It's 46 days after the crime, I think. They've already had two sets of uh, uh, police teams come in and really sweep the place clean. I mean, now when I say sweep, they pick up what they want and they dump everything else in a pile in the corner of the room. Yeah. So the room looks like a wreck. The, the closet's been removed. I mean, it's really a, a messy situation. The bed's been removed. And... Um, uh, they go to the to the spot where the clasp was, and it's not there anymore. And so there's you can see them in their gowns and stuff discussing what to do. And they finally do find it. And then, uh, you know, much to my surprise, they pick it up. One gloved person picks it up, hands it to another gloved person uh, <laughs> instead of putting it in the evidence bag. And, and then miraculously what it seems happens is they forgot to photograph it on the ground. And so oh they take this piece of evidence and they put it back on the floor of this room. Uh, in order to photograph where it was, <laughs> about where it was, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, I mean, these things happen when when uh, a crime scene is being processed. But um, if if that's the piece of evidence, the one piece of evidence that uh, has Raphael's DNA on it, that's a pretty poor uh, piece of evidence. Do you see any indication that they'll be able to retest that and actually get anything conclusive? I, my understanding is some of the alleles, some of the DNA, actually didn't even match Raffaele. You can't eliminate the error that has been introduced into that system. When you kick something around on the floor or whatever, when something's moved around on a floor, it picks up what it picks up, and you can retest you know, uh, f forever. You're not going to be able to answer the question of where the DNA came from. What What probably is more important is just what everybody who watches a mystery show <laughs> understands, right? The clues have to add up. You don't find the one clue that supports a gut feeling that has been discredited by all the other evidence. What happened in this case is they had a theory, and forensic science, like any other science, is all about developing a theory, a hypothesis, if you will, that you can reject if the data doesn't match your hypothesis. Instead of rejecting the hypothesis that Amanda Raffaella and Amanda's boss had, had killed Meredith Kircher, when the evidence came back and showed the DNA of someone who is not any of those three people that they originally accused, someone who's in the criminal database, somebody whose DNA is unflushed in a toilet in the house, somebody whose DNA is on the victim's belongings, including her purse, that is on her body, right. that is in her body. Rudy Gaudet. When you get when you get that evidence of Rudy Gaudet, you throw out your initial hypothesis because it doesn't match the evidence. And you start over again with a new hypothesis based on evidence. What they did instead was they substituted one person for another, they stuck to their original gut feeling, and they looked for whatever it was to justify. That is what it seems. If, if Raffaello was there, how did he get his DNA just on the metal point of a bra clasp, whereas Rudy Gaudet's DNA is all over that bra and all over the victim and all over the room? Why is Amanda's DNA not there? They, they said she cleaned it up. If she can find DNA <laughs> and clean it up with her eye, I want to hire her. You know, <laughs> nobody can do that. I couldn't do that. Uh, so I think you have to look at the totality of the evidence. Let the evidence drive the theory of the crime. You can't just stick with a gut feeling that's been proven wrong and then try to find some scrap of evidence to protect that theory. That's what I think happened. Dr. Greg Hampikian from Boise State, thanks for making the time tonight. You Pretty compelling stuff you've shared with us tonight. Oh, good. I'm, I, I, hope, uh, I hope I was understandable. <laughs> it was terrific. Uh, <laughs> that was not a problem. Thanks for coming on with us. Okay. Thanks very much. Oh, you're welcome. Good to have you here. So, like I said at the beginning of the segment, 
an innocent woman, in my mind, is sitting in a prison in Italy for no reason.